America's Heartland is made possible by the American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KBIE to support America's heartland programming. Contributors include the following. Today you'll find a growing number of consumers concerned about what farmers are doing to protect the environment. Hi, I'm Jason Schultz. Coming up, I'll take you to the wide open spaces of Wyoming to meet a farm family that has a unique approach to sustaining the land. Hi, I'm Kristen Samos. There are a growing number of farms and ranches in this country that are being run by women. We'll take you to Alabama, where a lady named Annie D has a focus on farming, family, and conservation. I'm Rob Stewart. Coming up, we'll take you to South Louisiana. Do you have any idea what this is behind me? Well, here's a hint. It comes from grass, it is sweet, and it will end up on your table. We're taking you on a trip back in time to explore agriculture's role in American history. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. That history comes alive in Virginia at the home of George Washington and Colonial Williamsburg. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. Close to the land. Look at any survey these days and you'll find out that folks want to know about the environment and where their food comes from. For farmers and ranchers, that's meant more of an emphasis on the land that sustains their crops. And for one farm family in Wyoming, that attention has brought national recognition. Elisa, Tom, and Anafield Grove are helping out their dad, dropping off salt licks for the cattle on their Wyoming ranch. But cows aren't the only animals in evidence here. If you listen closely, you'll hear the bleeding of goats scattered across this Wyoming rangeland. And there they go, off to their weeds. Ryan Field Grove didn't start out to raise a herd of goats with his cattle. That changed when he looked around to find an environmentally friendly solution to battle an invasive and out of control weed problem. The weeds were impacting the grassland feed for his cattle. We had a, a very bad leafy spurge weed infestation problem several years ago and, and growing up that's all I did was spray weeds. Because we're a dry land operation we don't do any farming and we buy all of our own hay. So that leaves us to take care of the cows, fix fence, and spray weeds. In his research, Ryan discovered that goats can be very effective at eating weed canopies. The goats, along with flea beetles to destroy the roots of the weeds, provide a natural herbicide solution. That allowed more grass to grow and gave Ryan time to grow his cattle business. We had assistance from our local weed and pest to pay for herding and at certain times trucking and water because we did seven years of about 700 to 1,000 head at one time to really reduce the weeds. It's just been in the last three years that we now are able to scale back and, and run the 100 head year round to keep the weed in check. Half of these are pregnant and are gonna kid in September. Establishing the goat herd demanded an initial expense for the ranch. As the herd grew, however, Ryan was able to sell off surplus animals and use that income to pay for the feed and labor costs associated with the goats. 
So with nature helping out the Field Grove family, they decided to return the favor. The area surrounding their 10,000 acre ranch is home to a variety of wildlife. Ryan installed barbless wire on the bottom rung of his fences, allowing animals to crawl underneath without being injured. This is potentially feathers from a sage grouse from flying into it. The field groves also participate in a conservation program designed to protect a bird known as the sage grouse. One task involves installing reflectors along the fence line. We mark our fences that are, that are in areas where sage grouse uh, like to stay so that when they're landing or taking off, they can see the fence and they don't fly into it. We're trying to reduce mortality. And then also our rotational grazing is, is designed and planned so that we are out of those areas that are called lek areas where their breeding grounds, their nesting, and their early brood rearing occurs. We see where it, the fence starts to go down. The family's environmental efforts have not gone unnoticed. They received national recognition for their work, winning a prestigious Leopold Conservation Award. That achievement has reinforced the family's belief that improving the environment is an essential element in improving their ranch's productivity. We really enjoy being here. I think the emphasis is that it is very family oriented and it has taught our children good morals and a good way to start their life. I hope that someday maybe one of them will at least want to continue their lifestyle out here. At least one younger member has decided already. I called dibs on our house, <laughs> so it, when I grow up I really want to live here because I like just living on a ranch. As for their conservation efforts, Ryan says it's all about finding the balance between the environment and enterprise. You can have environmentally good practices that also are profitable for the ranching operation. And I think that that's what I feel good about is we've found a balance. One more environmental note, agricultural land in the Cowboy State provides critical winter habitat for 75% of Wyoming's wildlife. And there's a lot of agricultural land, nearly 30 million acres. By the way, long before humans and livestock trod that soil, dinosaurs were common in Wyoming more than 100 million years ago. Working a ranch or farm these days demands an understanding of crop conditions, livestock prices, weather challenges, and just good management. It also demands a real commitment to farming practices that offer long-term benefits to consumers and conservation. For one Alabama woman, it's those challenges and opportunities that keep her excited about working the land. Go on, Cap. Go on. Anyone who knows Annie D will tell you there's nothing this farm woman can't do. She's a go-getter and, you know, she'll outwork most men I know. Annie oversees operations at the D River Ranch. Spread across some 10,000 acres, the ranch sits near the Alabama-Mississippi border. The ranch is made up of a half dozen family members, including Annie's brother Mike and her sons Seth and Jesse. But there's no mistaking who's in the driver's seat here. She is. She is. She calls all the shots. And we just follow. Uh, well, she does it all. There's not one thing around here that she can't do. She really loves to run the combine. Her passion is riding horses and working cows, and she does that a lot. Coming back, well, you got one out there. Whoop. Annie began her farming career after graduating from college, working on her family's farm in Florida. In 1989, they sold that property and moved D River Ranch to its current home in Alabama. Well, here we have a cattle operation and a row crop operation, and this morning we were working cattle. We were separating the cows from the calves weaning the herd, and this afternoon I'm going to be combining corn. Like other agricultural operations across the heartland, Annie will tell you that the days here are long, and you're never short of something that needs to be done. Working the land with horses and farm equipment, the family and ranch hands will tend a thousand head of cattle and rotate a half dozen crops. The ranch also focuses on keeping the land productive by making environmental improvements. It's what's feeding us and it's, 
It's what's going to feed future generations. And if we don't maintain this land that's growing our crops, it's, it's not going to be, they're not going to be able to raise crops in the future and there's going to be a lot of hungry people. Annie and her family have placed some of their land in conservation reserve programs. They've replanted native trees and grasses and in an effort to conserve water, establish reservoirs to collect winter rains for summer's dry months. We built a reservoir where I can catch wintertime runoff and I can pump out of a, a storm creek, store that water that, that uh, is everywhere in the wintertime, utilize it during the growing season. We had 36 days this year from the, mid, the first part of June to the middle of July. We didn't get a drop of rain. That's, that's when I'm trying to grow a crop. Hoping to educate the public about the work being done by farmers, Dee River has partnered with school districts and universities, bringing students out to the farm to talk about farming techniques, consumer issues, and agricultural technology. One of our keys is utilizing every acre to its best potential, and we've got to do that because, you know, our, our, our input costs are, are rising just drastically every year. So in order to combat that, I've got to produce more off every acre. And not just this year, I gotta be thinking about 10 years down the road. That long-term view touches every aspect of this ranching operation. Protecting the land, meeting consumer demands, and providing the opportunity to continue a family farming tradition. I hope that we can continue to do what we're doing. My kids hopefully will have the same shot at it that I have, and, uh, and hopefully their kids. We just have great faith and we just know year after year we're going to go do it again. When springtime comes, we plant those seeds and we go again. We just don't ever give up. Cows came to America with the first settlers from Europe. The bovine arrivals included those in Jamestown, Virginia in the early 1600s. And history books point to domesticated cattle as far back as 5,000 years ago. By the way, there are more than 900 different breeds of cattle in the world. Still ahead on America's heartland, let's go to Louisiana to meet some sugarcane farmers with a promising future. I'm Sarah Gardner. Still ahead, we'll take you to Virginia and two of American agriculture's most historic places. We'll take you back to the 18th century for some farming techniques at Colonial Williamsburg and the home of George Washington. Ever have one of those fruits or vegetables that you walk by in your grocery store and you're a little afraid of because maybe you've never eaten it or cooked it or maybe even heard of it? Well, for lots of folks, bok choy falls into that category, but maybe it's time for you to give bok choy a try. It may look nothing like it, but bok choy is actually in the cabbage family. It's crispy and sweet and traces its origins back several centuries to China but you'll find it in markets and stores all over the world now with several different varieties. In the U.S., it's grown commercially in California. You'll find it grown in other parts of the U.S. as well, especially areas with large Asian American populations. Bok choy is common in stews, noodle, and rice dishes. The best thing about bok choy, besides its flavor, is its versatility. Boil it, steam it, add it to stir fry, or just pan fry it with some olive oil and garlic for a great side dish. Need another reason to give bok choy a try? Well, it's nutritious. I mean, it is green, right? It's got lots of vitamin C, vitamin A, and calcium, and it's low in calories. So I think it's time for you to take bok choy off the shelf. I've never met a farmer that didn't work hard to take care of the land they love, and that is especially true for the family you're about to meet right now. Come with me to South Louisiana to meet the Blanchard family, sugarcane farmers, planting roots for the future. Meet Lane Blanchard. He's a fifth generation sugarcane farmer in New Iberia, Louisiana. My wife, I tell you, you know, I got sugar in my blood. Lane spent his entire life in these leafy green fields, farming 3,000 acres of sugarcane alongside his father, brothers, and sons. So Lane, take me in here because I want to see exactly what sugarcane is. First of all, I had no idea how tall it is. Yeah, well, it's just in the starting stages now. The, uh, this cane will get up probably on an average of about 10 feet tall. 10 feet? Yeah, at harvest time. 
And so where exactly is the sugar coming from? Well, actually, as this cane is going to grow, it, uh, it makes what they call internodes. Internodes, if you, okay. If you, if you dig down deep inside, there's very few now, but... Oh, there you, it is. If you look here... That's the cane. That's the cane itself. And this is what it'll look like, you know, once it grows out to maturity. Each of these plants on Lane's farm will produce for three years, with a sugarcane harvest every 12 months. Once harvested, the stalks of cane are hauled to a processing plant, where they're crushed to extract the raw brown sugar crystals inside. After processing, trucks will haul the brown sugar to the plant's storage area. How did they get what you grew to this? Through a process what we call grinding sugarcane. Grinding sugarcane, and then what happens from here? From here, it's going to go to a refiner, and they will refine it one more time to make a white sugar. Lane sugar is shipped all over the world, ending up in soft drinks, candy, pastries, or in your morning cup of coffee. Being the latest in a long line of cane farmers is important to Lane and his family. I think I love it so much because that's what he has always wanted to do, and it's been in his family, you know, for years and years and years. And, you know, and now that my boys are working with him, and I can see how much that they love it. Um, and just being along their side, helping and, you know, as a wife and um, it, it, it means a lot to us. Number one, try to help pay for this weed control cost that a sugarcane farmer has. These days, improving the crop means improving the land on which the cane is grown. To do that, Lane is taking part in the Louisiana Master Farmers Program, a statewide project with environmental coursework and accreditation requirements that the farmers must meet. Lane is doing everything he can to improve his soil quality because he knows how important it is and it's for the future of the farm. It's not something that he's going to get an immediate return on, which um, is really powerful and it's great farm management technique. That's part of what, what we're trying to learn is how to preserve this soil for future generations. You know, people don't realize how important the soil is. You know, it's not just about going out there and working the crop. The soil is very important. We're taking every measure we can to preserve this soil for future generations. To be able to manage this soil like it would be part of me. The expansive tracts of sugarcane here are a far cry from the 90 acres first planted by Lane's father Harvey a half century ago. But the family's farming dream remains the same, watching the roots of this farm continue to grow in good times and bad. But farming's that way, you know, you gotta, you gotta be that when it's bad to, to reap the good. I'm proud of him and the boys for all they, you know, come through because it was uh, good times and bad, you know. Why is it so special to you, Lane? Well, it's all I've ever done. I mean, I grew up on a farm and it's all I ever wanted to do. Well, you're living your dream. Yep. <laughs> and it's a sweet one, too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Sugarcane is part and parcel of Louisiana's agricultural history. Jesuit priests first brought sugarcane to the state in the 1750s, finding Louisiana's climate and soil perfect for the plant. It's also a popular crop in almost every tropical and subtropical region on Earth, grown in more than 90 countries worldwide. It's no surprise that the cost and choices of food that you buy at the supermarket are a direct result of American agriculture being the most productive in the world. And farming today owes a debt of gratitude to early American farmers. Where? We'll start in Virginia, where archaeologists are making new discoveries about George Washington, the farmer. Tell you what, I just get hungry when I walk around this garden. Just set Dean Norton loose in George Washington's garden and watch his enthusiasm spring from the soil. Then some red cabbage, can't wait for that. I love, I love red cabbage, that's just wonderful. Got some new seeds coming up here, and once it's harvested, a new crop comes right back in afterwards. Dean is the director of horticulture at Mount Vernon, George Washington's home and plantation outside Alexandria, Virginia. Here, our first president grew tobacco, corn, and wheat, on five farms scattered across his estate. Dean figures he's the 37th caretaker of Washington's kitchen garden, a proud lineage stretching back to the 1750s. 
What you see here is not just reflective of Washington's time, but it's reflective of a person or a master of a plantation that did not have the space to just have a pure pleasure garden. He had to combine necessity with beauty. Necessity meant George and Martha Washington wanted a bounty of fresh vegetables from spring through fall. But letters from that era also suggest something else was needed. Washington, after the Revolutionary War, was, was honored, was admired, was worshipped, and he knew that he was going to have guests from all around the world visiting uh, on a weekly, daily basis. And so he needed to change his garden that reflected the man that he had become. And so he needed a flower garden. The gradual replacement of veggies with flowers continued into the 1980s. By then, almost the entire garden bloomed with beauty, but nothing to eat. Then archaeologists took a closer look at diaries and documents from Washington and his workers. The gardeners are spending much more time cultivating vegetables than they are flowers. So we know without a doubt that they were here. We used to have 2,000 square feet of vegetables. Now we're cultivating 10,000 square feet of vegetables, which is much more the sort of equation that Washington would have wanted. To go from something that was totally wrong historically to something that we think is so totally right is incredibly exciting. When you visit Mount Vernon, or Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, you see the legacy of love for the land shared by these two founding fathers. Both believed agriculture to be the noblest of professions and crucial to the future of the Republic. They were also innovators, practicing crop rotation to preserve the soil, experimenting with new breeds of crops and farm animals and both believed the best farm tools were the ones you made yourself. Nicholas Kimball is an apprentice blacksmith at Mount Vernon, following the path of craftsmen dating back to 1755. By uh, taking a look at the crops that are being grown here, we can look uh, at historic precedents to the tools that would have been used in that industry. Some things that you would have found made here, so this is a, uh, a style of hoe right here. We've also got a, uh, an axe right here. This is a manure rake. And you'll see it's a very uh, unique design. It's kind of like a cross between a pitchfork and a rake. But American innovation and invention date well before Washington's day. You'll also find it here at Colonial Williamsburg. Established in 1699, this one-time capital of the Virginia Commonwealth was preserved for the future by a fortunate quirk of history. Well, in, in a sense, uh, we can thank Thomas Jefferson for that, because when he moved the government of Virginia to Richmond in 1780, this town went to sleep pretty much for 150 years. Today, thousands of visitors watch reenactments of historic moments leading up to the American Revolution. Williamsburg has realistic examples of 18th century farm life, demonstrated by folks who actually live here and keep everything authentic. Milling lumber, raising livestock, tending to 80 acres of gardens. And uh, I can cultivate, which is getting the weeds out. And you have to win the war on weeds. Historic farmer Ed Schultz and his horse Lancer are turning the soil between rows of corn and tobacco. We call it a hoe plow, and I'm here to tell you I've used it many, many miles, and it works great. But the horse works great, too. Visiting these historic places offers more than just a glimpse into the past. It returns us to the agricultural roots shared by many Americans, and perhaps we come away with a greater appreciation for this most essential industry. Jefferson said that 95% of Americans were farmers at his time. That's how important agriculture was. And the same things that were important then are important now. It makes you a more complete human being to know where your food comes from. And that's why I'm here, to help them see that. Again, it's just even more of an honor to know how special the land, agriculture, cultivation of the earth was to the founding fathers, because that's my profession, and, and I love it too. 
That's going to do it for this edition of America's Heartland. Thanks for traveling the country with us. We're always pleased to have you along as we introduce you to interesting people and places. And remember, you can stay in touch with us 24-7. We'll make it easy for you. You can find us on many of your favorite sites or just log on to americasheartland.org to see video and stories from all of our shows. We'll see you next time right here at America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland, living close to the land There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand In America's heartland, living close, close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by the American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following.